Welcome everybody to session seven on Find the Link Parenting. We've had six amazing sessions. Thank you everybody for joining early. Um, we'll be starting right away. Apologies for the late starts. Um, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint um, presentation um, where I'm going to introduce the speakers very briefly before they start speaking. And I'm happy to say that all our speakers are in the house already. Okay, so it's Find the Link Parenting. Our aim is to empower parents and raise change makers. And today's discussion is about parenting and the physical health of children. Um, we have in the house a pediatrician, a surgeon, a pediatric surgeon, and a dentist. And the aims of the series is to enlighten, empower, inspire, and to give. And that's what these amazing people are here to do, to give us some more insight, to give us some more knowledge so that we can be better parents and the, so that we can empower and encourage others to be as well. Physical health and any health at all is a gift and it's a great source of distress to a parent when a child is ill. We know, we know how much sunshine and laughter children bring into a home and we hear parents talk about Ogamadam when a little child has arrived on the scene. So it does cause a lot of distress when a child is ill in a home. And our speakers today, Dr. Busayo Babatsunde, Dr. Eme Kawachuko and Dr. Akinlabi Ajao will be doing justice to this topic today. Um, and I will introduce them once I've pinned them on my screen, once I've stopped sharing. I'll just talk about the sessions briefly before I take this off our screen. So next sessions coming up are parenting and mental health, parents with special children, parenting with challenges, and some more. And it's going to take us all to the end of July. So sit back and enjoy. There are a few sessions on the YouTube channel. Please watch them. I think we have sessions one, two, three on there already and the latter ones will be joining them shortly as well. We have an active online group on WhatsApp. You're welcome to join. Let's keep in touch. They're going to be replaced on YouTube, um, Twitter, Praising Child, Instagram, Facebook page, Living Your Dreams with the Praising Child, which is my motto. And you can send emails with feedback to tabletopandpraisingchild at gmail.com. And our motto for the series and the sessions, which we believe is going to be our motto for ourselves and our children, is I and the children God has given me, we are for signs and wonders. Um, we are going to go to Dr. Akinlabi Ajao, our pediatric surgeon. Um, I didn't want Dr. Machuku to hear me say that um, one of our doctors said she gives children chocomillo and lollipop to pacify them in her clinic. <laughs> so that Dr. Machuku does not have a fit. Welcome, Dr. Ajao. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Ajao. I think I need to ask, all, ask you all yes, a question you. about how we can, we can make um, the hospital a bit more pleasant for children. I'll share a story about that before we end. Um, but I did see a, a 30 something year old lady who was very, very upset because I told her that she might need to go to the hospital because she was very unwell and she burst into tears. She was there with her mother who was much older. And then she, she was asking her mother that did her mother remember when she was two years of age and they took her to the hospital and there were so many people pulling her hands and her legs and she was on a metal trolley and she was still traumatized and she was in her 30s and she remembered this incident at the age of two. And you know, what, you know the way people apologize on behalf of people that have done things generations before? I felt like apologizing for all the doctors because of how psychologically traumatized this lady was. So maybe we can make changes in the way we pass um, the perception of doctors and the hospital in general um, to children in some way. And maybe parents should stop saying, ah, don't go to the doctor, don't give me injection, that kind of thing. I think parents have a part to play in that. 
But even in the hospital, I think there are things we can do a bit better. I know in some parts of the developed world, they have play therapists and all of that. But I know in the developed world, we've not yet quite got there. But hopefully we can make some changes <laughs> that are appropriate. Dr. Ajao, I'm so sorry for keeping you waiting. We are looking forward to your session. <laughs> okay. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Should I go ahead? I'll go. Yes, you may. Yes, you may. Hello. Okay. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, um. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Um. Uh. I'd like to. I'll share my um screen from here. Thank you. you just need it. Okay. Can you see? Can you see the screen now? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can. I can. I can. Right. Thank you. Okay. No yeah, so I was, uh, I was speaking on um, common surgical problems in children that, that, that I think um, parents should know about. Um, I want to thank um, Timmy for this opportunity because um, in, in most um, settings, in most public health discussions, um, surgical problems in children are rarely discussed. Um, it's a neglected part of global health, as people have said. Um, you have um, multinationals, you have um, the WHO spending so much on research in um, the field of um, in, in, in malarial diseases in children, in um, diarrheal diseases in children, and you really hear people talking about the surgical problem. So it's uh, it's nice to be talking about this. So I guess I got a little bit excited preparing the topic. I I put in so much. We'll see how far we can go. I try to go as fast as I can. I'll try to um, uh, um, put out the important information out there. So thank you. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So I, I wrote that um, surgery is not a cause, uh, as I have seen that um, so many, especially, yeah, so I was speaking from my, much of my experience has been from Nigeria. So I'll be speaking from um, my Nigerian experience most of the time. I've had some experience now in the UK for, I think, about eight months now. So I have some little experience, but most of my experience for the past um, 10 years has been in Nigeria. So I'll be able to talk more about my uh, experience in Nigeria. So surgery is not a curse. Um, so many people, once you tell them that um, uh, you require surgery or your child requires surgery, I mean, you just see that um, that element or that feeling of defeat. They, they feel like the the devil has eventually um, defeated them or their enemies have had the last laugh or the last say. Uh, I don't know why that is that, but uh, we need to understand that surgery is just another modality of treatment. It's just like using medicine. In some situations, you can use medicine. Uh, in other situations, you may need some physical or mechanical intervention, which is provided by surgery. So it, it is not a curse. It is performed by human beings like uh, you, uh, who are just trying to make a living, if I can say that. Yeah, so um, do we operate on children? Yes, definitely, we operate on children. We operate on even newborn babies, freshly born, out of the womb. Yes, we operate on them. We operate even on fetuses. And um, I, I think about two or three years ago, we celebrated Dr. Lutoye from the a Nigerian working in the U.S. who's been operating on fetuses. So I, I use this example when uh, when uh, I have parents ask me, I, I, "Where were you caught in this small baby? Do you can you operate on this small baby?" And I say, "Okay, so some people operate on even unborn babies. So why not? Your baby is an old man or an old man already." So yes, we, want, we operate on children. So when uh, there are situations where you cannot use medicine, there are situations where uh, uh, medicine has failed or medicines have failed, and there are situations where surgery will provide a better or a faster uh, treatment for that condition. So in, in, in those situations, we have no choice but to intervene surgically. So yes, we can perform surgeries in children, and there are conditions that we have no choice but to offer surgery. So please don't be shocked, please don't be surprised when your doctor says, yes, your child is gonna need um, surgery. There are things that make parents scared and I've included them in this slide. So one thing is um, anesthesia. The field of pediatric anesthesia has significantly improved in recent years. So that 
advanced advanced events are actually very rare nowadays and even when they occur we are better equipped to address um, this um, adverse event so you really uh, get uh, adverse events and where we uh, this where parents can actually come in with their prayers you can pray for your kid as they're going for surgical uh, for surgical procedures and that might make the difference between believers and non-believers so um, um, adverse events are rare adverse events can be taken care of prayers can also help um, I've also put here that uh, surgical conditions are not necessarily more dangerous than medical conditions. So what wants to say it is surgery. It doesn't mean that, man, your child has so bad a disease that even medicine cannot work. So like I said earlier on, uh, medicine might not even be an option. Um, and um, I'm sure uh, as a surgeon, I've um, operated on kids. And the last time I've seen those kids, was um, on the operating table. I never saw them after the surgery. Uh, the best is probably just phone calls to parents or phone, call, phone calls to parents. Uh, and I'm sure Dr. Baba today will be able to allude to the fact that they see patients and they can keep seeing some patients till those patients die. Meanwhile, so surgical conditions, you treat them and that's it. And you never, see, many of them, you never see them again. Many of them, you never ever see them again. So surgical conditions doesn't necessarily mean uh it's so grave a disease that uh even medicine cannot work you are finished no it's it's just sometimes that's the only option next slide please so um i'll start discussing the um specific conditions now um the first i'd like to talk about are the hernias hernias are the most common uh conditions that we have to deal with as pediatric surgeons worldwide it is so common and they are commoner in boys and what are hernias? Hernias are actually protrusion of organs within the body through the wall or the boundary of the part of the body containing them. And the most common size we have these hernias are around the abdomen. And the most common type of hernia we know we have are the ones that occur in the groin. We call them the inguinal hernias. They actually, so, um, can you go to the next slide? Let me just show the pictures. So they're actually, they result from weaknesses or abnormal openings within the wall under the skin of the abdomen. And you will notice that there will be a bulge in the lower part of the abdomen in boys and sometimes can extend into the scrotum in boys. And from the picture you can see now, you'll see that swelling just below the abdomen on the right side or on the left side of your screen now, on the left side of your screen coming down towards the scrotum, which is the right side of the patient. And that's a typical hernia. And the common organ that comes through that abnormal opening or defect in, inside the wall that goes into the scrotum is usually the intestine. So in this situation, in hernias, you actually have intestine going through abnormal openings within the wall and going into the scrotum. And usually they are completely painless. They are completely painless. So the child can have it. And uh, it doesn't mean your child is uh, very endowed and the testicles are big. It's, it's actually an abnormal thing. It's actually suggesting that something is coming from within the abdomen and coming out into the scrotum. The other thing is that that swelling can actually disappear. The swelling is usually intermittent, so they, they disappear. When there's anything that makes the pressure within the abdomen increase, like crying, like uh, straining, then you see the bulge. When the child is completely quiet and lying down, it can completely disappear. And this can be deceptive for parents many times. So they, it's a swelling that is not consistently there. They, they've seen it in January. The next time they saw it was in December. So they think uh, it's completely painless. They think it's nothing. It's, it's nothing to worry about. I'd like to say here that if you've seen something abnormal, something you've never seen before, it's important that uh, you, you get the doctor's opinion. Now, the problem with hernias is that they can actually, because it's organs going through a tight opening within the wall of the abdomen, it can actually become trapped sometimes. Trapped so, so it can trap the bowel and make it so tight that blood fails to supply that part of the bowel and that part of the bowel can actually go dead. And that can result in the death of the child. So it's important that we do not ignore this and it doesn't give any warning sign. You don't know the one that, so people can carry this for 15 years and it, it, it causes no problem. While some people can carry it for just two days and uh, they're in trouble. So it's important that as parents, we take note of this. You see a bulge in the lower part of your child's abdomen. It's important that a doctor sees this child. And in boys, sometimes if it gets trapped, it can actually damage the testicle on that side. It can cause the testicle on that side to actually die off. And this is, so that's why it's important that this is managed. Once that swelling is noticed, it's, it's, it is painless, it is intermittent, it doesn't matter. A doctor needs to see. 
The other one I would like to mention here are the hernias that occur around the umbilicus. You can go to this slide after the next slide. Okay, I can't, oh, okay, the, the, you, you don't have the diagram there. Okay, so so um, it's the it's a swelling around the belly button. I'm sorry that picture is not coming up. So it's a swelling around the belly button that um, the Yoruba is usually called Idodo. So it's actually a hernia. It's actually as a result of a defect, a hole in that part of the abdomen. And that swelling you see is actually intestine bulging through the hole to the underneath of the skin. In that case, we don't usually treat. Usually, umbilical hernias will close by themselves. Usually, by age five, many will close. They are very common in Africa, very common in Blacks. They will usually close up. Some close later. We are not usually worried. But in certain situations, we get worried because sometimes the hole is so small and the intestine is getting stuck intermittently within it. The child is having intermittent pain. The child is having intermittent vomiting. In that situation, we may need to treat that kind of hernia. So it's important for parents to know. So once you have a child who's umbilical hernia is disturbing, you may need to, you may need to treat. And in some situations, especially in girls, when umbilical hernias are so large, we may need to treat as well for cosmetic reasons. Um, next slide, please. So the next condition I would like to discuss are the undescended testes. And I find this very, very interesting because I've seen uh, kids 14 years old being brought to the clinic without testicles at all. And when you ask the mothers, because it's usually the mothers that bring them, when you ask the mothers, they'll say they didn't know that uh, the scrotum is supposed to contain anything. Or some of them will say they didn't know that there are supposed to be two testicles there. And I find this amusing because usually these women are married, uh, they have husbands, and I completely cannot understand many times, I, 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 it completely dazes me that you don't know that there are supposed to be testicles within the scrotum. But yeah, the, the reality is that so many mothers do not know that there are supposed to be two testicles within the scrotum. And the scrotum is that bag underneath the penis. So most mothers are more concerned at the, about the penis. They get worried when something is wrong with the penis. Uh, meanwhile, they, they don't know so much about the, um, uh, the scrotum itself, which carries the testicles, which is responsible for the fertility that they so much uh, cherish or they're so much um, worried about. So ideally, there should be two testicles within the scrotum that should be checked immediately the child is born and should be checked as the child also goes up. So intermittently, mothers, fathers should check if they can find a testicle down there. Now, in some situation, the testicle can be retractile, in which case it is down sometimes, it is up within the body sometimes. That is completely normal for pre-pubertal boys. Once they attain puberty, that should stop. But there are situations in which the testicle is not found at all within the scrotum. It has never been found. That one is what we call the, those are the ones we call the undescended testes. It can affect one side, it can affect both sides. In that situation, it is important that a doctor's um, opinion is sought. Now, there's a reason why God has placed those testicles outside the body. It's because the temperature, the temperature in the scrotum outside the body is quite lower. It's about two degrees centigrade lower than that of the body. Now, if the testicle remains within the body, the temperature is believed to damage the testicle, especially the sperm cells, so that the fertility of that child can actually be affected. So it's important that once you find out that the testicles are not there, down there, you see a doctor, because that should be brought down into the scrotum before the child is two years old. If that is not done before the age of two years, usually we do it about nine months to one year of age. If that is not done, before the age of two years, the fertility, especially if the two sides are affected, may be affected in the future. The other thing is that that testicle in the future can undergo cancerous change, in which case it can become, the child can develop a testicular cancer at about the third and the fourth decade of life. So it's important that these things are addressed. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, Dr. Babatuli mentioned jaundice in children, uh, especially in, in newborns, and that can be normal within the first few days of life as a result of certain changes that, um, that go on within the system of the child. Um, however, it is important for me to mention here that when you have jaundice, and she has also um, said that once you have jaundice outside this age group, then you should be worried as a, as a parent. You should take that child to see a doctor. I must also say that when you have jaundice occurring within that first 28 days of life, which is expected to be normal, but that jaundice is extending beyond two weeks. 
then as parents, we should be worried because that jaundice may actually be as a result of an obstruction to the normal flow of bile within the body. And because bile is expected to move from the liver to the intestine, if there's a blockage in that passage from the liver to the intestine, there will be accumulation and that can backflow into the liver and eventually damage the liver. Now, there are certain conditions, certain surgical conditions that are known to involve the blockage of bile from the liver to the uh, intestine, and they should be addressed. Usually, you must address that problem within the first 90 days of life, or at most within the first 120 days of life. If it goes beyond this, that liver may be irreversibly damaged, and the child may actually require a, a liver transplant. And this is a problem in developing countries because that service is not usually or readily available in developing countries. And even in developed countries, you may need to wait and wait and wait. And this is, it is a cause of significant morbidity and mortality in children. So it is important once a child is having jaundice extending beyond the age of, uh, extending beyond two weeks, it is important that we we'll take that child to the hospital as soon as possible because it's going to take time for the, your doctor to make a diagnosis and then institute treatment. And if this goes beyond the 90 days barrier or the 120 days barrier, then it becomes a problem. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so I've also included here circumcision. So circumcision is a very, very, very common thing that we perform on boys in Africa. Uh, it's performed by the Jews as well. It was a covenant between Abraham and God, where God instructed Abraham to, to circumcise all males born in his family. And it should be maintained from generation to generation as a symbol of the covenant between God and Abraham. Now, um, circumcision involves cutting off of the foreskin, which surrounds the penis after birth. And usually because of this covenant, most families in Africa or most and, and virtually all Jews perform this ritual within the period we call the neonatal period. That's within the first 28 days of life. The average is that most people will perform it on the seventh or on the eighth day of life. Now, the issue with this is that this is actually cutting off of the skin and you're using sharp instruments. Now, because that is being performed by human beings, obviously, mistakes can happen, mishaps can happen. And I have seen several boys being brought to the hospital with a part of the penis cut off, a complete half of the penis cut off, the urine pipe being cut off, or the, the, the more, the, the, the sadder one, a situation in which the child has a bleeding disorder and the child has completely bled to death. And this is common. And I've seen a precious baby born by a, a woman over 40. She had been looking for a child for several years, eventually had a child. And the child, unfortunately, had a bleeding disorder, which wasn't evident to them, circumcised, and the child died. And it was very, very sad because it was a precious baby. Now, it is important that whenever we want to do circumcision for our boys, that we take to people that have the expertise, people that are knowledgeable about the procedure, people that are that have knowledge about how the procedure is performed and people that have knowledge about how complications or possible complications from that procedure is dealt with. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that this should be handled by a pediatric surgeon or by a surgeon or even by a doctor. It can be handled by anybody. The important thing is that that person should be an expert in the procedure. Uh, I think the, the, the best experts are actually the, uh, uh, the, the, the Jews. And they are, they are not necessarily doctors that perform this procedure. It's only important that you are sure of the person who is performing this procedure before that procedure is performed. Um, next slide, please. Okay, that's another picture that's not showing. I tried to, unfortunately, it's just unfortunate I can't share my slide. I don't know why it's not. So I, I wanted to show pictures of um, circumcision missiles that um, I have seen uh, where there's partial amputation of the penis, partial amputation of um, the urine pipe as well. Yeah, so the next thing that we'll be discussing is, the, uh, is vomiting, recurrent vomiting, and I put their bilious and non bilious. So bilious is when you have a green or yellow in the vomit of the child, while non bilious is when you do not have green or yellow. 
Now, uh, Dr. Barras talked about vomiting. Vomiting is a common symptom. It's a common thing that kids will present with. It's common in so many medical and surgical conditions. Now, which ones should we be worried about from a surgical point of view? The first are children of about two months of age, especially boys, that keep having non-green, non-yellow vomiting, which is persistent, which is recurrent, and which is coming out with some force. We call it projectile vomiting. In that situation, you may need to see a doctor because it could actually be as a result of an obstruction in the outlet of the stomach. So it's important that when you have a child two months and below or around two months, with vomiting with some force, as in the vomiting is going some distance from the child, it has no yellow, it has no green, the child is always vomiting, despite the fact that the child feels hungry, then a doctor needs to see because it may need some simple surgical procedure, which you can do and by the next day you're on your way home. The other uh, type of vomiting we should be worried about are the bilial vomiting, which is when vomiting has green or yellow and it is persistent. The child keeps vomiting. It could actually be a symptom of a severe condition we call intestinal obstruction. Now, intestine can be obstructed by different things. And one deadly one is when the intestine is actually twisted within the baby because not only is it obstructing the intestine itself, that's it's obstructing the lumen of the intestine itself, it can actually cut off the blood supply to that part of the intestine as well, and it becomes deadly. Because once the intestine dies, the child is also at risk of death or at risk of severe morbidity. Now, we've had situations in which we've operated on kids with this kind of condition, and by the time we got there, the, almost the entire small intestine is completely is dead. And in a setting like Nigeria, where we don't have uh, um, things to support this kind of kids, they eventually die. Even though the surgery is going to be successful, we're able to remove the dead bowel, we're able to join the remaining bowel together. That uh, remaining bowel is usually inadequate to sustain the child's life, and eventually they die. So it is preventable. The child is vomiting, the child appears to be having some abdominal pain and is vomiting green. It is important that we do not stay at home to treat this. We take to the hospital as soon as possible for a doctor um, um, assessment and uh, possible management. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I've also mentioned here constipation. Constipation is a very, very common uh, thing that children can present with. Um, uh, in my little experience in the UK, it is very, very, it is significantly, I don't know, it is very, very common. And this is usually as a result of the type of diets. Usually diets are in, in Western societies are low in fiber. Uh, people really take uh, fruits, people really take even water so that most of the kids become constipated. So the most common uh, form of constipation are the functional constipations that can be dealt with by dietary modifications, uh, taking more uh, fluid and things like that. However, there's a condition we call Hirschsprung's disease, which is actually a surgical condition in which the lowermost part of the intestine of the child does not have nerve cells. And because they do not have nerve cells, they cannot propel um, feces or stool the normal way intestine is supposed to propel it. And that because of that, they accumulate a lot of feces within the abdomen. And then you have the child not passing stool with massively descended abdomen. That kind of child should not be treated at home. That kind of child should be taken to a doctor to assess. Now, the other things that can give parents uh, an idea that this might be a surgical kind of constipation is that those kind of kids may have failed to pass the first two after birth within the first two days or the first three days. Many of them may not pass their first meconium on the first two until they are three days old or four days old. And then subsequently, they may not pass two more than once in a week or once in two weeks. Those kind of kids should be assessed. Those kind of kids may have what we call Eschmung's disease. And the only treatment for that condition is surgery in which case we need to remove that part of the bowel that is bad and replace it with the normal bowel. It is important that these kids are treated as early as possible because if they keep growing this way, they begin to fail to thrive. They begin, they begin to fail to gain weight adequately like they should, and they may be falling ill repeatedly. And some of them can actually die from this condition as a result of infection. So it's important that parents are aware of this. Once you start noticing that the child is not passing through regularly, it's once in three, 
it's once in uh, three weeks, it's once in two weeks. Those kind, uh, those kids have, need to see a doctor. Next um, slide, please. Next slide, please. Can you see me? Next slide is on already. Yeah, so I've included the interception here because it's... Yes, I have it now. Thank you. And yes, we now, have um, Thank you. So interception is a situation in which um, a part of the intestine actually goes into another part of the intestine, the adjacent part of the intestine. And what this uh, causes is that because the intestine has gone into itself, it will obstruct the intestine. And then you find out that the child starts vomiting. Now, after a while, the child will also start crying intermittently. So the child will be folding up the leg in pain, suggesting that there's pain in the abdomen. And usually this condition actually affects children between the age of three months to three years, usually. And the peak period is actually between four and nine months, around the time when the child has been introduced to adult diets, around the, child, uh, the time when the child has been weaned. So they can develop this intersusception in which the bowel goes into each other. And then you start noticing that the child also starts passing bloody mucoid stool. Unfortunately, in our setting in Nigeria, once they see this, is they think the child has a, what they call JDJD or pile, and they start giving herbal concoctions. Uh, or in some sadder situations, you actually have medical officers seeing these patients and thinking that the child has dysentery. It is important that once you see a child less than one year having blood in stool, having bloody mucoid stool with vomiting and pain, abdominal pain, intermittent abdominal pain, think of interception, send that patient to the hospital immediately. It is an emergency. The child can lose the bowel, so the child can lose its life. So it's important that the doctor sees as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Yeah, so abdominal pain is a common uh, presentation in children, especially in older children. So many conditions can present with uh, um, abdominal pain. Abdominal conditions can present with abdominal pain. Chest conditions, problems with the respiratory tract can present with abdominal pain. Problems in the scrotum can actually present with abdominal pain. So it's important that we, we, uh, we are aware of this. So many, many of these uh, uh, abdominal pains are actually completely uh, non harmful the child can get over them. However, there are those that we should be worried about. And the first I'd like to mention, and the most common that uh, would require surgery are the acute appendicitis, which I'm sure so many, almost everybody knows about. So acute appendicitis is a situation in which the appendix, which is a part of the bowel, becomes inflamed, and it can present with significant pain in the right lower part of the abdomen. So once you have a child having pain in the right lower part of the abdomen, is unable to move properly because of pain in that part of the body, take appendix, take to your doctor. It's important that the doctor sees. They can also have features like um, loss of appetite and uh, uh, nausea, and rarely they can have vomiting. Very rarely they can have vomiting. However, if we delay in treating, they can get complicated. You can have a rupture of that appendix, and then they can start vomiting. They can start developing fever, and at that stage, the morbidity and the chance of mortality is going to be very high. So it's important that we catch it at that stage where the child first complains of that pain on the right side. So pain on the right lower part of the abdomen, let your doctor see. It may be nothing, it may be something. It's important that the doctor sees. Uh, the other thing I would like to mention on the abdominal pain is are the scrotal pain, which I'm still going to discuss later. Uh, or let, let me wait till I, I discuss the scrotal pain. Uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I'm trying to rush this. Uh, it's because of the time. So I'm trying to see how far and how fast I can go. So yes, that's actually the next slide. Pain in the scrotum. Now, pain in the scrotum is very, very important for us to be aware of as, uh, as parents of uh, the boy child. Now, the testicles within the scrotum, we mentioned earlier on on undescended testes, are actually hanging on a pedicle, like a rope, which actually contains the blood supply to the testicle. Now, it can happen that that's, uh, uh, some testicles can be so mobile that it can twist around that pedicle. And what the child will present with, and it usually occurs around puberty, I must mention this, usually occurs around puberty. Now, what can happen is that that testicle can twist on that pedicle, and it will give the child significant pain within the scrotum. And if that twisting continues, it can actually cut off the blood supply 
through the testicle and the testicle can actually go dead. Now, how will the child present? I mentioned earlier, the child will, com will complain of severe sudden onset pain on a particular side of the scrotum within the testicle. The child can also present with swelling of that testicle and redness around the test around the scrotum, which will suggest that something, something very significant is going on within that scrotum. The child can also have nausea and vomiting, and the child can also actually complain of lower abdominal pain. Now, it's important that I emphasize abdominal pain because sometimes all the child is going to complain about is actually the lower abdominal pain. So the child just tells you, I'm having lower, I'm having abdominal pain. Mommy, my tummy is pain in me. And you need to look for that. It could actually be the scrotum. So I would advise that parents should actually check out the testicle of their kid anytime the kid complains of significant pain in the tummy. Just have a, have a look and have a feel. It may be the difference between losing that testicle and saving it. Now, there's a golden period we have to save a, a twisted testicle. And that period is actually six to eight hours. Six to eight hours. So it's not the kind of pain the child, because sometimes the child can develop the pain in the middle of the night, 2 a.m. It's not the kind of pain you say, OK, don't worry, I'll take you to the hospital once we wake up in the morning. You might lose all the time you have, because you might get to the hospital you may need to wait in the waiting room for another two hours before you see your doctor. And before you know it, it's 10 a.m. for a pain that started at 2 o'clock. Before they get to the theater, the testicle is already gone. So it's important that once the child complains of testicular pain, significant testicular pain, vomiting, swelling, take to the hospital. It's an emergency immediately. Sometimes it could just be some infective uh, uh, um, um, condition going on. Let your doctor determine that. Assume it's the sinister one. Assume it's the testicular torsion. Take to the hospital immediately. Next slide, please. Yeah, so just like we have testicular torsion in boys, we could actually have ovarian torsion in girls as well. Um, and this is a situation in which the ovary, which produces the eggs in girls, can actually twist along with the fallopian tube around it, can actually twist, and the blood supply also cuts. And that can also die off, just like the testicle can die off in boys. And usually those girls who present with severe abdominal pain, usually lower part of the abdomen, it can be on the right or it can be on the left, because the girls have two ovaries on the right and on the left. And so it can be on the right or it can be on the left. In fact, in girls, once you have severe pain on the left, please think ovarian problem. If it's on the right, it could be appendix. Like I mentioned earlier, it could be ovary. So it's important that your doctor see. So they can present with severe abdominal pain and vomiting associated with the abdominal pain. So once you have a child complaining of sudden onset abdominal pain and then begins to vomit, please, that child should go to the hospital. That's not the child to treat at home. That's not the child to observe at home. Take to the hospital because you, you, time may be of the essence. Time may be what will save the ovaries. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the last condition. Yeah, so in conclusion, um, there are quite a number of um, surgical conditions that can affect children. Children on, undergo surgery. The only treatment for a child's uh, condition that you're worried about may just be surgery. So you may need to take the child to the hospital to have surgical procedure. Um, anytime you see something that you have never seen before, or anytime something you, you are observing seems to be out of proportion, like abdominal pain, looking like it's out of proportion, don't assume the child is pretending. You've never seen it before. Please take your child to the hospital. Let the doctor see and let the doctor reassure you if it is nothing or let the doctor institute some treatment if it is something sinister. The earlier, it's always the earlier, the better. The earlier, the better. Time is always of the essence. Sometimes you may see, you, you, may, you might have observed something. It will take time for the doctor to assess and make a diagnosis. And it may take time for the doctor even to even book you for treatment. So it's important that once you've noticed something, the earlier you can take the child to the hospital, the better. Don't say it is painless. Don't say it's, it doesn't like it appear to be disturbing the child. Don't say it has been there for years. It is important that you take that child to the hospital as soon as possible. Um, thank you. I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ajao. Um, that has been very, very concise. And uh, apologies for making you rush through it. It's um, a blessing that you can talk so fast, really. <laughs> but that was really, really good. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I don't know Thank whether you. we have 
Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Dr. Ajao, that was a very an excellent presentation. Very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, school mother. Sister is very proud of you. You have done well, my son. Thank you, school mother. <laughs> okay. I'll bring Dr. Busi as well here. Um, I don't know whether Dr. Wachiku is still with us. Um, I think Dr. Busi probably has one question that she's to answer. And I don't know whether anybody had a pressing question for Dr. Ajao, although I think he has done quite an extensive work. Um, Dr. Busi, I think you have a question or you had a question either. Dr. Babatune. Are you there? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, so somebody had a question about about a seventeen-year-old. Okay. So I was going to mention that earlier, but uh, well, I struck it out. Adolescents, when the teenagers are difficult, especially those that have um, chronic diseases who have been on medications for long, when they get to that age, it becomes difficult to get them to continue. Then they suddenly are tired. They don't want to gain. So, well, there's no one size fits all um, trick to all of them. You have to find different things. I've had um, some children where what worked was, okay, we gathered all the other children in the house and then handed them maybe folic acid and then handed this child his own drug. So he, he accepted because other children were taking something as well. There was one that the mother, I mean, the mother got so frustrated, she threatened to leave, her, leave the girl in the hospital and leave her to die. I think at that time she had a brain, brain reset, you know, so it, it, it varies. Um, the, the, the thing to do is that with children, especially with the older ones, whatever intervention you want them to take, especially with the lifestyle modifications, there has to be support. The family has to provide support. I'll give an example. I have two children right now that are monitoring for obesity. One child is about 12. The family is so supportive. In fact, by the time they came to me, I was wondering why they came to me. They are, they are on all domains, they were already doing something. And this morning, the father still sent me a clip of them walking and then they were calculating calories, calculating sleep hours. The other child, the mother is telling me, she's busy. She doesn't have the time to, all, to do all this. So she's telling the child, are you, are you listening? Are you listening? You know, so of course, prognosis is already obvious here. So the, for lifestyle modifications, the family has to be part of it. So for this girl that is, um, she's a picky eater, she eats on junk, she's not menstruating. I'm suspecting, I don't know, I'm suspecting, mother didn't mention, she could be anorexic already. That would be responsible for why her periods are irregular. And um, you are saying that you've been waiting for appointment for a year. So I'm also suspecting you're not in Nigeria. You be in UK. So I'm not familiar with that system. So maybe you should talk to Dr. Temi. She may be able to um, direct you better. Uh, and then, so there may be some mental health assessment as well, because she may be, the child may be angry at something, so she's acting out. So somebody else may need to come in to dialogue. Of, she's 17, so you can no longer, you, you, you just have to dialogue with this child and keep dialoguing and dialoguing, explaining why what is, you know, and hope that she would, um, she would um, cooperate with you eventually. But I think she's talked to Dr. Timmy, she may be able to direct you better, since she knows the UK system, which uh, I'm not familiar with. Okay. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Before you go, um, I, I don't think I remember to mention it in bio that you run an obesity clinic. Um, so what would you say are the things parents need to do to avoid obesity from the onset? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there are about three or four domains. Of course, food, yes. Um, Divide your plate into two, have more veggies, some fruits, protein and carbohydrates. Now, uh, I, I mentioned a, a family I was addressing and I asked the mother who was in cooperative, what fruits do you, does a child take? And she mentioned all the wrong fruits, grapes, apples, pineapples, all the sugary, all the sugary things. So you have to remember that um, do more non-sugary leafy vegetables. Um, have regular meals, have one family, um, meal if possible that way you can all eat together you can foster healthy habits in that period 
you must be firm with your children. They cannot continue to manipulate you to give them um, high calorie foods. Apart from being obese, it affects their gut's microbiome. So it affects their immunity as they continue to grow older. So it's not just about how they look, whether they are fat or they are sleep, it's also about their immunity. You're feeding your immunity. So diet is a whole big topic. You need to find information about that. You can try myplate.gov. Yes, myplate.gov or something like that. Yes. So Google it, one, two. Um, physical activity. Children are encouraged to have at least one hour of moderate to moderate to vigorous um, physical activity every day. They're supposed to sweat. Your sweat is your fat burning. So see if, if your children can get one hour of physical activity every day. Sleep. There, there's, there's, uh, there's a chat. Okay, children should get about at least nine hours of sleep every day. Okay, and then um, don't, don't, they, don't let them just sleep at any time, wake up at any time. Their body has cortisol that regulates all that. And then um, screen time. That's the last thing I'm going to talk about, screen time. Children under two years are not supposed to get any screen time. The older ones, you should schedule their screen time. With longer screen time, that they can uh, sit down for long, snack for long, being inactive for long. And when it's time to sleep, remove screens, gadgets, phones from their rooms so they should sleep. All right, so those four areas, I've talked about diet, I've talked about physical activity, I've talked about screen time, and I've talked about sleep. So please, research on all those four areas. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that would be very helpful to a lot of people. Um, I think this is a question for Dr. Ajao. Um, and while he starts answering the question, start getting ready, final words for the house. Thank you. Um, so this question is, please, what is responsible for sudden pain on the upper part of the stomach? Please, very urgent, age 12. Sudden pain on the up, on the right upper part of the stomach. Yeah, so... Um, that's very... Yeah, you know, so if I, if I understand that, that, that's on the right-hand side of the child. Yeah. And the child is uh, age Twelve. one to two years, I think. Twelve. Child so, is uh, yeah, it, it will be difficult to um, to suggest all 12, male or female. Um, no. So, yeah, okay. So, because I, I thought it was age one to two. Okay, so age 12, sudden onset, yeah, sudden onset uh, pain on the right hand side. So, a, a number of things can cause that. It could be something cons uh, uh, completely innocuous, like uh, maybe just some gas causing some cramps within the bowel. And, and that's it, uh, it's nothing important. Or it could be something surgical within the organs around that area, which would include um, the gallbladder. So if the child is a sickle cellar, immobilizing regularly, there could be some stones within the gallbladder, which may be causing pain when, they, when there's, there could be infection within the gallbladder, there could be stone within tight areas of the gallbladder or within the ducts. Um, leaving the gallbladder, which can cause pain in that kind of child. So it's important that someone assesses. Uh, another thing that it could be in a boy, it could actually be a testicular, it could be intermittent testicular twists being felt in that area. Another thing it can be is um, if it's going a, a little bit towards the back of the right hand side, it could actually be a problem within the kidney. And it could be different problems, it could be stone within the kidney. It could be uh, um, some obstruction of the pipe taking urine away from the kidney towards the bladder so that there's an area of tightness. And once the child drinks a lot of water, there's accumulation of water with the, of, of urine within the bladder, uh, within the kidney for a while before it finds its way down. So the child can actually develop pain around that time. So it depends on other things surrounding it. And if the child is vomiting in, in, in association with it, it could actually be uh, like I mentioned earlier, some form of intestinal obstruction. So there's a condition we call malrotation in which the, 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 the arrangement of the bowel within the abdomen is actually abnormal. And because of that, the, uh, the intestine is more susceptible to twisting. So in some kids, you could have, what well, usually those kind of kids would have been showing those signs since um, they were babies, intermittently having abdominal pain with vomiting. So you could have some intermittent twisting of the intestine and then untwisting. So it depends on what it is. So that child may, be, may need to go to a doctor to properly assess. They may need to examine, ask a few more questions. 
do some uh, some ultrasound scan or some CT scan to make a proper diagnosis. It may be difficult to actually make a diagnosis with just this um, little information. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Ajao and Dr. Osayo and Dr. Wachuku in absentia. Okay. Um, thank you, ev everybody, for being an amazing audience and sharing your Saturday afternoon with us. I'm definitely hoping it's been worth your time. Final words from Dr. Babatunde and Dr. Ajao. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Dr. for inviting me to speak. I hope I've been able to impart some useful information to you. Um, whatever, I know parents, nobody has a degree in parenting, we're all winging it, okay? And thank God for these platforms that help us to know better, to share. It's like a support group. So Dr. Temi, thank you for setting up platforms like this to, to help um, all of us. All right, thank you everyone. Have a nice week ahead. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Dr. Uh, Akilabi, please hold on. I'm looking for you now. <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And what's here? Yeah. You can speak now. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, I'll just say. Fine. Okay. So final words is uh, parents. Um, yeah. Like uh, Dr. Babatun just said. Yeah. It's always a new thing to learn every day. Important things. Always look out for your child. Always examine your child. Um, there's a new thing I've noticed in the UK here where parents have no knowledge about their about their kids. And some have even confessed to having more knowledge about their dogs and their kids. You ask them about how many times does your child go to the toilet, they don't know. How many testicles does the child have, I've never checked. Uh, there's no shame, there's no shyness. The child is your child, you've, you've delivered this child. You should know everything about the child. Let's be observant, let's look around. You see anything strange we've never seen before, let's look for help and let's look for help early. Um, I think that's all I, I would want to say at this time, thank you. Thank you very much. Before you go, Dr. Ajao, someone asked a question whether you think boys are more prone to diseases than girls. I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> or maybe you're yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, Yeah, true. Maybe, maybe Dr. Babasu will be able to talk. <laughs> yeah. So maybe Dr. Babasu will be able to talk about that more. Yeah. Unfortunately, that, that's the truth. Almost all bad conditions and pediatric surgery are common in boys. The best we have is um, some uh, equal... No, equal Please, let's mute ourselves so the speakers, we can hear our speakers. Speak on, please. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we are listening. Go on. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, most conditions... Most most bad most disease conditions are actually common in boys. Very few are more common in girls. Like the surgical jaundice I mentioned are common in girls. But most other things, most other things, almost every other thing is common in boys. Uh, some people have suggested some genetic things related to the fact that um, we don't have the we don't have a double X chromosome. We have um, one X and then one Y. Some people have talked about the fact that immunity in boys are generally lower, so they are more prone to having all these problems. And of course, by the time you get to teenage years as well, or to adolescents, boys are more adventurous, so they are the ones that will die from or injure themselves from trying funny tricks. So, so many things are common in boys, unfortunately. Um, uh, so it's important that we look out for our uh, boy uh, children. <laughs> Uh, despite the fact that almost everybody is talking about the girl child, uh, it's also important that we take care of our boy, uh, the boy child. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. I, I do believe that um, the, the male species are, are a bit endangered in many ways, and we should not neglect them in any sense. They are very, very important, even just from the point of sustainability of the species. Apart from the fact that we need them to have stable families and stable societies so i think we can do more um sometimes we we know that sometimes female children appear to be a bit more fragile although they have strengths in many other ways but let's also pay a lot of attention equally to our male children and to our men as well <laughs> we are rooting for you <laughs> okay 
So thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone that's here. God bless you.